welcome to this uh, sponsored session from Inside Life Tech. My name is Emanuele Barbato, and today we'll discuss about the contemporary adoption of invasive coronary physiology with microcatheter-based technology. I'd like to, wel to welcome my colleagues, uh, uh, speakers and operators here with me today. Uh, from the Cardiovascular Center Alst, we have uh, Carlos Colette, one of the uh, speakers, Bernard de Brun and Jeroen Song, uh, operators of the live case that we are going to uh, see uh, later on, and Salvatore Brugaletta from Spain. Uh, welcome to all of you. Uh, I cannot uh, start this session without uh, uh, mentioning the great job that uh, Simone Biscaglia is doing at the same time in the, in the chat. Simone is our chat master. So uh, how does it work? Uh, we will have two uh, parallel discussion between the live session and the chat. So Simone is chairing the discussion there. If there is any questions that you want to uh, ask, just uh, feel free to do so. And we'll try to capture some of the discussion that is going on in the chat also live here in the studio. We are here today mainly to address the three important points. The first one, we'll try to understand all together the role of microcatheter-based physiology, also through a critical appraisal of the literature. Uh, we'll try to know uh, how to correctly adapt the novel true physio microcatheter, and we'll discuss the uh, uh, importance of physiology assessment to plan, optimize the coronary intervention, and why not also to assess its final result. Now, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce Salvatore's lecture. So let's hear what he has to say on, uh, on this topic. Salvatore. Thanks, uh, Emanuele, for introducing me. So it is my pleasure to uh, start with this uh, interesting topic. So these are my conflict uh, of interest. So first of all, so we should ask ourselves why we need uh, this microcatheter-based FFR. So to me, there are two main reasons. The first one is that uh, so when we use a pressure wire, so a pressure wire will never be comparable as a regular workhorse cost wire, like for example, BMW because so in a, a conventional wire that we use in our daily practices, so there is much technology. So we have different material, different coils that are combined between them. So giving to the um, regular workers wire a very good uh, trackability, navigability and torqueability. Instead the pressure wire, so is a, is a, a wire that, which doesn't have so high technology. So it's very difficult to, I mean, to torque, to navigate inside the coronary vessel. And the second reason, so is uh, actually because of this, uh, because of this uh, uh, trackability, because um, so when we have a, a, a tortoise vessel, like we see, for example, in this uh, anjo, so we feel more comfortable to using a regular workers wire and then to use on the top of this a microcatheter based FFR. The same so is, for example, for multivessel disease or still lesion for making a post-PCI uh, measurement, for making pullback, or for, for example, evaluating bifurcation. So every time that we have this, we have to deal with this anatomical uh, situation, so we feel more comfortable with uh, our work or wire. And then, so if, uh, for example, um, so we see which is the difference between these two technology. So the pressure wire, as uh, we have uh, uh, said, so there is a pressure sensor, which is, uh, uh, around uh, 30 millimeters from the distal tip of the of the wire itself, whereas in the microcatheter base FFR, so there is the pressure sensor which is located uh, very close to the distal tip of the uh, very close to the distal tip of the of the microcatheter, and uh, it is uh, quite easy to locate because we have two radio opaque markers in between the pressure sensor, and we can go uh, as a microcatheter so on the top of our work hose wire. So this is not only the difference between these two technologies, but there are also other differences uh, which made the microcatheter base FFR so easy, easier to use. Like for example, the fact that we can go fastly going in and out by using our work cost wire. The work cost wire is always in place, so we don't need I mean, to uh, recalibrate the wire, so the wire is always in, in place. And also to make some pullback is quite easy because uh, so we just needed to pull back the microcatheter, but we don't need to move the, the wire position. It's also quite uh, uh, easy for, for example, for making a measurement after post-PCI, so we can go through the stent, and we don't need to disconnect and to reconnect the, uh, the wire every time that we want to make uh, a measurement. 
And then, so one can argue that, for example, using of this microcutter FFR as compared to the pressure wire uh, technology, so may have not good agreement because with the microcutter we introduce something inside the vessel and we can alter the FFR measurement in terms of pressure, for example, distal to the to the lesion. And actually, so the answer to this uh, question so is coming from this study, from the Supreme study, which is uh, uh, actually in press. And you see here that the agreement between the microcutter FFR and the pressure Y FFR, so in same vessel, is quite good, with a very um, um, narrow limit of, uh, of, of, of agreement. So between these two uh, technology, and looking especially at the drift of the devices, so you see that uh, it's even better with the pressure microcatheter, so that we don't have a rate, a high rate of clinical significant uh, drift as compared to the pressure Y. So this is my last slide. So now I'm happy to take any question if any. Thank you very much. Thank you, Salvatore, for this very uh, clear, short and concise uh, illustration of uh, what are the, the pros, the features of uh, this technology. I noticed uh, in your uh, presentation that you alluded to the position of the pressure sensor that is close to the tip of the microcatheter. Can you can you just uh, share in your experience what is the advantage of knowing exactly where the sensor is and, and the fact that it's close to the tip? Yes, thanks, Emanuele. So to me, this is a, a very important feature because um, so the fact that you can locate very well where the sensor is located allows you so to make a precise measurement. So the fact that, for example, you have the on the tip of the microcatheter the sensor, so allows you to go uh, off, so to go after the lesion, so to locate very well where the, the the tip where the sensor is located. Actually, there are two radio opaque markers, and you are pretty sure that uh, so you are crossing the lesion, you are making a good measurement. And then, so when you, for example, performing uh, you are performing a pullback, so uh, for because of, for example, there are some several lesions. So you can go step by step. So you are pretty sure that you are evaluating one lesion, two lesion, three lesion, because you can locate very well where the where the sensor is uh, is located. Another aspect that um, is always uh, uh, interesting to clarify, especially when you propose a new tool and new technology, um, is uh, how does it perform as compared to the current technology? I noticed the slide from the Supreme study that in the meantime has been published. Uh, and you alluded to the to the drift. So, what is the reliability of the um, true fissure microcatheter as compared to the pressure wire in your experience? Yes, as a as a show in the supreme, so the, the the reliability so looks very very good. So it's ninety five percent, and actually I was surprised also to see that you have less drift. This can be, I mean, uh, caused by the fact that uh, we are dealing with a. Uh, an optic fiber, so as compared, for example, with the other uh, pressure wire. And uh, so in general, so not only, I mean, looking into this technology, but uh, in general, looking at the other kind of uh, microcatheter based FFR, so the real bit is good. So the only thing that we should think is every time that we are measuring, so we are making this measurement in a small vessel and in very tight lesion. So in this um, kind of maybe less reliability, but anyway, all the studies agree that uh, if there is some uh, lack of reliability, so this is not going to uh, change our, our decision because uh, the value of FR, so looking at the threshold, so 0.8, so is not going to change actually the fact that you are implanting or not a stent. So. Thank you. Um, our colleague here, uh, Rodrigo from Mexico, is asking what are the top one, two indication for this technology, for the microcatheter-based technology over a pressure wire. So, uh, Salvatore, if you think to your practice and you think to these microcatheters, I know that you're an experienced uh, um, uh, interventional cardiologist and a good user of invasive physiology. So if you think to this device on your shelf, when would you use it? Yes, so this is a very good question. So I'm thinking about uh, two particular clinical scenarios. The first one, so is um, so when you have some serial lesion and you want to uh, make a sort of pullback. So making this pullback, you are pretty sure that you are measuring one, two, or all the lesions. So in the, according to where your microcutter is located, you are actually measuring so which is the value of each one of the lesions. So that uh, this allows you. To, be, to have the best treatment as possible, uh, treating, for example, one or all the lesions. 
And uh, this is actually quite good because uh, for the microcutter, you are just moving in and out your the micro cutter but the 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 guide wire is still in place so you don't have to be worried that maybe the wire so maybe uh, kinked in the in the distal part and then maybe you are not going through again and the second situation is for example a patient with multivessel disease so a patient with multivessel disease that you want to, uh, to measure so different vessels different lesion and you want to be comfortable with the guide wire so in this case you are using your work cost wire for example a bmw and then, so you are going in and out with a micro catheter, so that will be a quite easy uh, and fast way. So to measure the physiological value of each one of the lesions, so being comfortable because you are still using your best comfortable and workhorse wire. I think uh, your points are very reasonable, and I'm curious to uh, see whether the colleagues in Alst uh, um, actually adopted the micro catheter. Uh, um, the, 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 the true physio micro cutter in the way you suggested. So I, we are ready to go to the, to the cat lab and see the, the case they performed for us. Thank you very much, Emanuele, for this very kind introduction. It's an honor for me to introduce this excellent team in the Cardiovascular Center in Aalst. Next to me, somebody that does not require introduction, Bernard de Bruyne. We have our uh, nurses, Tom and Eddie. And uh, I think we will start by a case introduction by Emanuele Gallinoro, our fellow. Thank you, Jeroen. The case of today is a 57-year-old male. He runs 10 triathlons per year and he has never experienced an angina in his life. He was admitted to our emergency department because of an inferolateral STEMI. The culprit lesion was located in the distal circumflex and was treated with a primary PCI. But this is also a case of multivessel disease, as you will see from the uh, coronary angiograms which have been collected today. So thank you very much, uh, Emanuele, for this uh, case presentation. Let's, let's have a look on the angiograms that we acquired while waiting for you. And uh, on the RAO, you can see that there is a lesion in the proximal LED, a long lesion, maybe not that tight, and then there is certainly another lesion in the mid to distal LED. Next, we will see the diagonal branch a little bit better. Here we have it. This is the diagonal branch, the branch of the diagonal branch actually, which is severely diseased. Next. We have seen, by the way, I forgot it, that the stent placed by Carlos is nicely patent, but in the proximal part of the circumflex there is also a mild lesion that we will have to investigate. In this projection, we have a better view on the proximal LED, which angiographically look very tight. Next. Here we see even better the circumflex. The proximal circumflex is really what we call an intermediate lesion, angiographically spoken, and which really requires interrogation with intraconary pressure measurements. As far as the right is concerned, diffusely diseased, and in the crooks of the right, we see a lesion which is probably a little bit more pronounced on the posterior lateral branch than on the PD of the right. Again, this is something what we have to investigate invasively. Show the next one, Tom. That's excellent. Here we'll see it probably a little bit better. Yes, we see the ostium of the PL branch, which is angiographically, again, significantly diseased. We always say significantly diseased. Please remember that this is a gentleman who is running triathlon and never experienced any type of symptoms. So the goal of this uh, session will be to interrogate the tree vessel with invasive measurements on the basis of this Insight LifeTech True Physio catheter, which is a micro catheter, an over-the-wire micro catheter to measure the fractional flow reserve. Okay, so as you can see, we have uh, put two wires, um, one in the PD and one in the postlateral branch of the right coronary artery. Um, and I introduce, or I would suggest now that we introduce uh, the setup of uh, the machine and the wire, uh, the unpacking and the complete installation. Okay. Okay. 
So after unpacking, we're gonna flush the wire and then attach the wire to the console, the Vivo Cardio. Okay, I received the catheter and immediately see the two radio pack markers. There's the uh, pressure sensor at 2.5 millimeter from the tip of the micro catheter. Um, and it's a rapid exchange catheter, so we're gonna put it on the wire. Can I do it for us? Uh, yes. Feel that the shaft is quite rigid which gives you some push and the distal part is quite flexible which makes it really an easy catheter to cross tortuous vessels uh, also stent um, struts for example so first thing we have to do is to equalize the catheter so we go with the two radio part markers just at the tip of the guiding catheter to equalize So after the equalization and confirming a PDPA value of 1.0, we push the microcatheter down. It is the pressure sensor is almost at the tip of the catheter. You see the markers in the post yeah, in the distal posterior branch. And now we're ready for a measurement. Okay, so Bernard, I see you preparing the syringe for an FFR measurement. You will use intracoronary papaverin. You have flushed the line with some saline and you're ready to start the injection. We see a PDPA value of 0.93 and I think Bernard you're ready to yes, you make can. an injection with some intracoronary papaverin to measure fraction of flow reserve. Okay, injection of the papaverin, then you have to wait for 10 to 15 seconds. Okay. Then we see the PDPA going down 0.72. We have some stable hyperemia, and then if you agree, I will do a pullback. Okay, we start the pullback. It's very easy with this rapid exchange catheter to perform a pullback. We will see if there's a gradient in this distal lesion. And then you see during the pullback the PD value going up and we will confirm again a PDP of approximately one at the tip of the guiding catheter and that is the case. Okay, so we have confirmed um, an FFR value below 0.8, uh, 0.7072. I think that confirms that we will have to treat um, this distal right. If you agree, I'm gonna measure now the posterolateral branch and the FFR in this postulateral branch, what we expected, 0.7273. So exactly the same. this is going to be a bifurcation yeah. stenting. I will perform again, so we're still hyperemic, a pullback. I just pull the microcatheter over the wire. We can see there's a jump in this bifurcation and then going back to the tip of the guiding again, a value of PDPA 0.9798. Yeah, some small drift.
Okay, so we have stented the distal right and we're now gonna measure the post PCI FFR in the biggest branch in the PD, also in the sake of time. Okay, so Bernard, you're ready, I think, for yeah. the injection with papaverin. Yeah. So, yes, proceed. The injection. Yes, record. We are recording. And then we go down to 0.93, which is, uh, I think, for post PCI, an uh, excellent result. Yeah. Um, so we have uh, indeed increased flow. But I, suge I would suggest uh, you, only you to do a pull back at the end because okay. uh, we have seen before that the pressure gradient did not occur. You can go did not occur only at the level of this bifurcation, but also a little bit more proximally. Okay. Yeah. Well, and then That's when fine. we are distal to this long disease in the proximal to mid uh, uh, right coronary artery, we see an FFR of 0.97, yeah. so okay, this is fine. not significant, I think we can leave it here um, and we can show you the final angiographic results. So now we are ready to uh, measure the fraction flow reserve uh, in the circumflex. So as you know, the infralateral branch has been stunted uh, a couple of days ago. Um, and now we will have a look at the most proximal part of the circumflex um, and see if this is still significant and if we have to treat or not. Okay, we prepare again for a papaverin injection. going to flush the catheter with saline as we always do. I take 3 cc which means uh, 12 milligram of papaverin for the left. In the right we have injected <coughs> and we are ready. We are ready to go. You can record. So this is the resting gradient actually. There is a kind of reverse gradient which is already good news which is not absolutely impossible in the distal circumflex to have a pressure which is a little bit higher. There we go with papaverin. <coughs> and we wait for another 30 seconds to have a nice plateau. You know that papaverin is uh, working for approximately one minute with a nice hyperemic plateau of 20 seconds, 30 seconds. That's very comfortable. Uh, we advise not to repeat the papaverin injection within 90 seconds, 120 seconds, and Yehun is already pulling back. Here it doesn't make too much sense because we know that the fractional flow reserve in the distal part is strictly normal, but it's always nice to see that both pressures come back very close to each other in the proximal part of the vessel. Okay, so this lesion is not significant. I think we, we can, can proceed to the LED. Okay, so as you can see, the PDPA value in the distal LED is 0.8889. Um, borderline, let's say, and now we're going to inject the papaverin and we wait for hyperemia. Disengage. Okay. The guiding. Well, let's let's go, go down. down. I see it. Okay, so the FFR is 0.65. If you agree, I will perform a pullback. Yeah. Okay, so we're ready for the pullback. The nice thing with papaverin is that now you have 20, 30 seconds fully hyperemic situation to do the pullback. <coughs> no need for intravenous adenosine. Stop. Okay. Okay, so there appears to be a gradient in the most proximal part yeah. of the LED. Yeah, yeah. That's where we saw the tight lesion. Yeah. I think it's clear that we will certainly have to 
tackle this lesion in the proximal part. Um, I think if you agree, we're going to measure the diagonal branch, yeah. and then we decide on the strategy. Store. Okay, so the FFR in the diagonal brands is 0.73. I'm doing when I cross this lesion, there is already a gradient, but more proximal to the lesion, there's still, yeah, that's a of course, LED, yeah. because of the proximal LED, some gradient. Yeah. And then we go up yeah, to the okay. guiding tip one. Okay. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay. Now you can stop. Perfect. Okay. Stop. Okay. Now, my interpretation is that okay. the, the bulk of the gradient is the LED, yeah? The bulk of the gradient is within the LED, the proximal LED. LED. Yeah. So it's very clear from the pressure tracings that we see here in the room, especially from the pullback that Jeroen did, is that there are two jumps, one in the diagonal branch and one in the proximal LED. So in summary for the LED diagonal system, we have a lesion that we have to tackle in the diagonal branch and one in the proximal LED and not in the mid and distal LED, which changes a little bit what we thought to do uh, initially. Okay, let's go for it. Okay. And we will come back to you when we are ready with the final results. So we stand the diagonal branch or the side branch of the diagonal branch and we're going to do an intermediate uh, FFR measurement distal to this stand. We all agree that we will also measure of course the contribution of the, the proximal LED um, but we already dilated there so we'll see what, uh, what happens now. Okay, so we are we are ready to inject again in the side branch that we stunted in the diagonal. Okay. Nieuwe papaveen. And then we see an FFR. And now you can pull back to see whether there is still a double jump or whether there is only one. Look here, we are still at the exact the same level while we are proximal to the distal stems. Yes. So we can already assume that the diagonal is fixed. Okay. Yes. And the jump is related to the proximal LED. That's not a big surprise. We knew okay. there was still work to be done there. Okay. Good. Good. And now we will proceed with PCI of the proximal LED. So we are ready for the control uh, fractional floor reserve, so post PCI fractional floor reserve in the distal LED you remember that there were two lesions which angiographically were at least dubious and we hesitated to uh, treat them on the basis of the fractional floor reserve measurements before and especially on the pullback we decided finally not to do it. Now we go for, you can record, this is the resting gradient 
almost equal to one we are going to induce hyperemia that's it so there we go and uh, we are now looking at the distal pressure signal and you see that the fraction of the PDPA goes to 0.88, 87 and here we have a plateau so that is very reassuring very reassuring you can pull back uh, Jeroen even though a pull back um, when the pressure gradient is very small is of course always a little bit difficult to interpret even during hyperemia not to speak of the resting pullback there we are okay. in the guiding there's a little bit of drift, but not too much. Anyhow, it's obvious that this LED is no longer hemodynamically significant that we are done. Okay. okay, I agree. So we are going to have a look to the final angiograms together. First with the wires. Maybe you can pull back the probe. Yeah. I think the result is quite acceptable also angiographically so let's go for a control angiogram first in fast with cranial i think this is very acceptable the bifurcation is fine the distal led looks angiographically fine you can go to the ario with cranial ario with cranial okay yeah yeah that is uh, very reassuring and also the distal part of the LED looks much better expanded and this is important, it is better pressurized so that all these mild lesions look less pronounced after uh, stenting the proximal LED. Also the post-PCI IFFR is very reassuring in terms of, of, uh, of uh, the value of 0.88. I think uh, with all the data we have we expect both angiographically and hemodynamically a good result uh, on the longer term. So thank you, Jeroen. Uh, it was a nice demonstration of a complete functional revascularization of a young patient, very physically active still, uh, based on the fractional flow reserve measurements and pullback of these pressure uh, measurements. Um, I think it is impressive that we have done eight measurements, including eight pullbacks with the same catheter just over our workhorse uh, wires. And this allows, of course, to be very flexible and to be, uh, yeah, to, to, to perform many of these measurements during these relatively complex procedures. So I hand it to you, uh, I hand it over to you, uh, Emmanuel. Thank you very much for the opportunity and you, we will join you in the discussions, of course, if there are questions, please do not hesitate. Thank you, Bernard. And I can tell you, I will not it because uh, the chat has been overwhelmed by comments and questions. Uh, Simone is doing a great job in addressing many of them. Let's help him. Let's help him because the topics are interesting. So if you keep your answers short, then we'll try to address all of them. Let's start first with Jeroen. What is the compatibility of the true Fijo micro catheter with five French guiding catheters, Jeroen? Can we do that? Well, thank you, uh, Manuel. It's a very, uh, very good question. Yes, it's possible. Um, if I remember well, it's a 1.6 French uh, size. Um, so this fits perfectly within a 5 French catheter and it's very useful um, in the 5 and 6 French, indeed. And now I want to hear Bernard on this. What is the risk of false positive FFR, asks one of our colleagues, by using a micro catheter as compared uh, with a pressure wire? What's your thought on that, Bernard? Yeah, <clears throat> that's a little bit the elephant in the room, I would say. Of course, when we uh, enter any kind of device, we will create an overestimation of the gradients. Now, this still has to be um, investigated. This has to be done in vitro. It's way too complicated to assess that in vivo, by the way, but there is some overestimation. And this will depend on the size of the vessel, the severity of the lesion, and the flow which goes through the lesion. Thank you very much, uh, Bernard. Um, I guess the impact on clinical decision making of these uh, systematic overestimation depends also on the anatomic setting you're addressing. So intermediate coronary stenosis, which is what we are aiming at, should not be really much affected by these uh, bulky presence of the device, if I, if I may uh, elaborate further on your answer. 
Now I have another technical question to Jeroen. Um, colleagues were interested in the storage of the data on the uh, console. Can we do some post-processing, some changes, fine-tuning of the measurements? Yes, it's uh, a console uh, that is uh, mirroring a little bit what we have been used to uh, past, so you can uh, readily access the data, uh, move your cursor. So um, I think it's a very uh, convenient, uh, very uh, easy to use uh, device, both the catheter and uh, the console. Uh, lots of questions on Papaverin, I can tell you. People was very interested on this topic. Uh, I'll let you decide who wants to answer this. Uh, so they're asking what is the advantage of Papaverin versus adenosine, uh, whether there are different dosages in different coronary arteries. There is even one colleague who's asking whether there is a different threshold for hyperemia is induced by Papaverin as compared to hyperemia is induced by other agents. Can you uh, clarify this topic? Well, I will try to be very brief. Um, papaverin is um, not as long-lasting than IV adenosine, but enough to, to allow pullback tracings. Roughly, you have a plateau hyperemia of approximately 20 to 35 seconds, which is more than sufficient. Second, it can, of course, be given intracoronarily, which is a major advantage, in my opinion. It facilitates the procedure, and it induces a very nice steady state hyperemia, which is probably less, and it probably influences a little bit less the systemic pressure than intravenous adenosine. In addition, finally, there are no side effects of papaverin whatsoever. You alluded also to the dosages, uh, Emmanuel. That's right. Very, very simple. 12 milligram in the left, 8 milligram in the right. Uh, to be given as a bolus and to be flushed with saline, not with contrast, but with saline, and preferably even saline without heparin. But these are details, but saline. Now, Jeroen, uh, the pace is excellent. Eh? We are addressing many of the questions. Jeroen, now back to you. One of the colleagues is asking, uh, Aurel, Aurel Thomas, she's asking, I would have expected to measure first all the lesions and then make a decision. In other words, the colleague is also opening the door to bypass surgery in these patients if you would know upfront what is the invasive functional significance of all the lesions. I guess you, you had the reasoning on that, why to start with the right treat and then go further. I guess you evaluated the risk of these patients, right? Yes, um, so um, we have been um, calculating both syntax score, discussed with the patient, uh, so the usual process. First of all, the patient preference was PCI. Um, and second of all, we thought that it was really feasible to tackle these uh, lesions with rather short stems and rather focal treatment. Um, and uh, if necessary, we can also uh, think of cabbage if we would be uh, necessary, of course, in the future. So um, we didn't compromise the future of the patient with three focal stents. Um, and this was uh, what we had in mind. And uh, it was a physiology driven uh, revascularization. So in the end, the circuit we did in the treatment, I think it fitted well within uh, the discussion we had with the patient. And there is one aspect I'm sure that will be touched during the discussion with Carlos later on. All these hyperemic pullback gradients showed really focal gradients. So really lesions are amenable for stenting. But we'll come back on this later on during the next discussion. Bernard, a very nice uh, and interesting question to you. Uh, why to you? Because you've been also one of the co-authors of the recently published Flower MI study. There is one colleague who's wondering whether there is a role of this microcatheter-based physiology in the context of STEMI as it pertains to the evaluation of non-culprit lesion. And whether it makes sense, that is the extension to the question, whether it makes sense to still perform physiology non-culprit lesions. I guess there has been uh, some sort of superficial reading of the study. Can you clarify what are the findings? Yeah, we have no time to, to, to dwell into the details of the study and the fact that actually the study at the first glance looks a kind of negative study, but actually confirms the threshold of 0.80 as very useful to defer with certainty of not having too many uh, problems in the future lesions that are hemodynamically non-significant. So 
semi, we might say, well, why to bother and not just judge on the angiogram? Well, if we still perform these uh, pressure measurements, and I think these micro catheter would be extremely useful in these kind of patients, because you can do that over the, your workhorse wire, well, then you will save a lot of sense. Then the, the, the next question is, does it make any sense to measure fractional flow reserve during the acute phase? Well, the answer, the short answer at least, is yes, definitely. It makes a lot of sense, except in patients who are in shock, except in patients with a very, very, very low ejection fraction, then it's better to postpone. And then to synthesize everything, well, you can have the anatomy through the angiogram and the physiology of all your vessels during the acute phase and bring the patient back at the CCU with actually a complete work up of the patient. These patients, they don't need any other testing than what has been done in the cat lab, even after a standing. That's right. In addition, we shouldn't forget that uh, one third, 30% of the patients uh, with STEMI and MVD has been <laughs> just re uh, deferred, which is also logistic-wise uh, a very important message of the study. Bernard and Jeroen, if you have time, stay with us because I'd like you to join during the final discussion with Carlos. And I'd like now to move on to the next lecture and introduce Carlos Colette with this uh, uh, topic. Carlos. Thank you very much for this kind of invitation to participate in this symposium. Uh, the idea will be to extend what has been described by Dr. Brugaleta on the different uh, characteristics of the microcatheter and wire-based device for FFR in this talk entitled the microcatheter-based FFR to plan and optimize PCI and to assess the functional results. My name is Carlos Colet, I'm an interventional cardiologist, co-director of the CAT lab in Orbe Als in Belgium. These are my disclosures. So we know that randomized clinical trials have confirmed the benefit of invasive functional assessment to decide whether the patient needs to be revascularized. And this data, of course, comes from the landmark trial FAME 2. Uh, based on this, we know that the FFR is a, met is a vessel level metric that is a surrogate of myocardial ischemia. But if we add to the single point measurement of FFR a pullback maneuver, we can assess the distribution of epicardial resistance. And this allows us to understand whether the, the disease in this epicardial vessel is focal or diffuse. There is an increasing awareness of the usefulness of FFR pullbacks to plan and optimize a PCI. So we are going through or we're leaving the expansion of FFR from a first uh, uh, method to, to assess lesion significance now to a tool that allows us to understand one, the pattern of coronary artery disease, I'm thinking about focal and diffuse disease, that can be quantified, by the way, by the PPG, and to optimize the PCI using FFR pullbacks. I will not go into the details. You know already that there are two types of technologies, one based on wires, the second one based on microcatheters. And in this table, you can see the different types of vendors that offers the microcatheters-based technology and the wires-based technology. But I want to make the emphasis that for this specific uh, a part of the expansion of FFR, it's very useful to have microcatheters because it's allowed you to go in and out pretty fast to these pullback maneuvers and optimize your results. Uh, it's important to understand that there is an interaction between how focal or diffuse is the coronary artery disease and PCI. We see that in patients with focal disease, this is high PPG values, when we implant the stent, this patient has high post-PCI FFR. In contrast, when we do PCI in patients with low PPG or diffuse disease, these patients actually have lower post-PCI FFR due to residual pressure losses outside the treatment region. Now I'm going to show you a couple of cases where the FFR pulled by curve can be useful. I'm going to show you some cases that really uh, uh, changed my practice in the last two or three years. As you see in this slide, you see a right coronary artery which is diffusely diseased from the proximal part to the mid-segment and the distal part. But when you do a pullback curve, you start to understand better that this is not a function, this is a functional focal disease and not a diffuse disease. And this changes completely the plan and the strategy to treat this coronary vessel. And I show you the other, the other uh, part of the, the, the spectrum, cases where you have 
of an apparent focal anatomical disease. And you would say, I'm going to put a stent here in the mid-segment of the coronary vessel. But when you do a pullback, you are faced with a situation that there is no functional target to treat these vessels. In other words, the apparent uh, visual stenosis that you see in the angiogram is not producing any uh, focal pressure drop. And therefore, in this type of vessel, implanting a stent actually uh, is associated with all minor or almost non, uh, no improvement in vessel physiology. In this meeting, we have presented the results of a pool analysis addressing the predicted capacity of the PPG to predict post-PCFFR. And I just want to show you the relationship that, that there is between the baseline disease pattern, in other words, diffuse and focal disease, and functional gain or post-PCFFR. You see that when the PPG is high, in other words, focal disease, the gain in, 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 in conductance at the epicardial level is pretty high, but when the disease is diffused, we almost have no gain in terms of epicardial conductance. Now we're gonna move now to the setting of how to use FFR pullbacks to uh, optimize our, our stenting. And I'll show you a, an apparently simple case. This looks like a very simple lesion in the mid-segment of the LAD. We implanted the stand uh, in this region. The angiographic result looked pretty good. We were satisfied. But when we perform a post-PCI pullback, we start to see that there are residual pressure losses, not inside the stand, but in a lesion that is not visible by angiography. And this, of course, leads to low post-PCI FFR and eventually adverse clinical events. So we can conclude that the coronary physiology is expanding from a diagnostic technique to a tool that will help us plan and guide our PCI. New indications demand new devices that can be used several times in complex anatomy and several times post-PCI. The microcatheter in this regard facilitates the pullback maneuver and the assessment of post-PCI FFR. But we need further clinical trials indeed to uh, confirm the benefit of this technology. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Carlos. Um, I have uh, several questions uh, to you, um, starting from the, first, uh, from the first one. In planning and assessing percutaneous coronary intervention, Carlos, what are, according to you, the main limitations of pressure wire and what are the main advantage of the microcatheter based physiology? This was a bit touched during the initial talks and discussion, but it would be nice if you put them in a nice frame and just analyze pros and cons for us. Thank you, Manuela, for the question. <clears throat> so I see that in the planning phase, there are two questions that we need to answer. One is the lesion significant that is addressed by measuring one point in the distal part of the vessel. And the second one, is this a good uh, vessel to do PCI? In other words, do we have a functional target for it? And for that, we need to do a pullback. And this is where I see that the microcatheter technology may have a, a good uh, place in the cat lab because facilitating the pullback maneuver is something that will increase the information that you have concerning the coronary physiology and the disease in that particular vessel that will help you do a better PCI and having a higher uh, functional revascularization as measured by the post-PCI FFR. This is extremely important, Emanuele, in complex anatomies as Salvatore showed, and also in case with severe calcification that you don't want to rewire, I see in these cases that microcatheter could help a lot uh, facilitating all these maneuvers. Um, it was alluded both by Salvatore and, um, and uh, Jeroen uh, during the performance of the case, the fact that we know exactly where the pressure sensor is localized in this pressure um, pressure microcatheter. So between these two radiopaque marker, we like to do more and more, especially when we use intravascular imaging, the so-called co-registration, co-registration of OCT with angios, for example. So I wonder whether do you think that there might be an interesting application uh, of this uh, technology with co-registration technique in order to make you perf perfectly understanding where the physiology problem is within the coronary artery. What is your guess on that? That's a very good question, Manuela. And I, when I see the future, I see that this is indeed something that could even help us more to achieve a precise PCI. I see it in two ways. First, let's say the visual co-registration, when you see the markers in your angio and your fluto, and you know more or less where you are, that's going to be, the, let's say, the more visual assessment part. But also for a later co-registration, it will be relatively easy to track these very visible markers of the catheter along the vessel to perform, let's say, a more uh, precise 
uh, co-registration with, between physiology and imaging. You mentioned to the PPG. Yeah, that's an interesting concept. Uh, it's going really to uh, change our clinical practice and the way we select the lesion to be treated, the lesion not just to be seen on the angiogram, the physiology lesions to be treated. This has been validated with pressure wire, Carlos. Um, any, any thought whether this can be applicable to uh, microcatheter? I guess, Carlos, for some reason, ah, you're there. Any, any thought whether this can be also applicable to microcatheter technology? Yeah, so uh, the PPG actually can be calculated from any pullback curve. Uh, and indeed, what the microcatheter offers you is the ability to perform this pullback curve more easily. So I think it's, it's a big yes. And as you mentioned, Manuele, we're moving FFR from a one-dimension metric to a two-dimensional approach, trying to understand a little bit more the information coming from the pullback. And this is indeed something that will grow with the microcatheter technology. That's very clear. Thank you very much. I'd like to involve in the next uh, two questions, two short questions, the operators. Uh, so Bernard and Jeroen, please join us in the discussion because there is a, a one um, practical question. Bernard, they heard you mentioning during the case that there was an inverse drift in the circumflex and you mentioned it's not a problem. It can be well possible. One of the colleagues is interested in understanding uh, your uh, thought about that. Well, I cannot remember exactly what I said, but uh, there was indeed a very small drift of, I think, two or three millimeters of mercury, as we unfortunately are used to see with many devices. Now, this being said, I think that um, this device in particular, but also the other devices, uh, intraconary pressure measurement devices, I mean, have controlled the problem of drift to a large extent. And this was not the case four or five years ago, but nowadays, I must say, drift is no longer a real issue. Now you are trying to uh, tease me to tell you something about the difference in height, probably, of the coronary arteries as compa compared to the guiding. Now, this explanation is a little bit long to do without the support of a slide, but just remember that in the distal right or in the distal circumflex, we might well have pressure signal which is a little bit higher than the than the pressure signal in the in the central aorta recorded by the guiding simply the fact that the pressure wires are not immune to the hydrostatic pressure this is the trick we sh we simply have to keep this in mind but this has nothing to do with drift that's very clear. Uh, I don't know who wants to take this very last question. One of the colleagues, having seen uh, the potential application of this device in uh, uh, assessment, functional assessment of the stent result, perhaps this is a question for you, Carlos. The colleague is asking whether there is any cutoff value for stenting of FFR that we can rely upon. Well, that is... Uh... That is a tricky question, Emanuele. I would not say that there is a consensus on the post-PCI FFR value that we should uh, gain. What we know so far is that this cutoff value appears to be vessel in, uh, dependent. So the cutoff value for the LAD will be different from non-LADs. This is the first message. And the second message is that the predicted capacity of post-PCI for event is at best moderate. So I think we should temper our enthusiasm on post-PC FFR as a metric of prognosis. But do we need more information on this topic for the future? Thank you very much, uh, Carlos, Jeroen, uh, Bernard, and uh, of course, Salvatore. I think it, it is now time to wrap up. There was uh, actually, there is a very last question from Sonia. I was asking, uh, in light of ANJO-based uh, technology, you know, ANJO FFR, VFFR, and so forth, whether we need this additional tool, this microcatheter-based physiology. Well, my simple answer to Sonia and to the colleagues is simply yes, why not? It's an additional option that we interventional cardiologists have. It's just a matter to understand how to correctly positions all these devices and all these options. What I see is the ANJO-based technology would rather play a role in diagnostic cases, in diagnostic examinations, while devices like pressure wires, microcatheter-based physiology uh, uh, devices could well play a role in the context of interventional cases, where certainly might facilitate 
the adoption of the invasive physiology, which is the, the, the main theme we are all interested in. With this, I'd like just to draw two, three uh, final takes. Yes, we have a new device. We learned how to uh, place this device in our uh, procedures. Uh, there is much more to come because most likely this device will also be uh, used to assess the uh, functional uh, distribution of the atherosclerotic disease within the coronary artery. We heard uh, the near future, the potential application of PPG, um, even with this uh, technology. With this, I'd like to thank Simone Biscaya, our chat master, who did a great job uh, in uh, answering uh, the tens of questions we had in the chat. Our sponsor, the Inside Life Tech, of course, PCR for making this uh, possible, all the setup, and of course, the speakers and operators. Thank you very much, and uh, good continuation of EuroPCR 2021.